We've been looking at the historical evidence for the fact of the discovery of Jesus' empty tomb, and we've reviewed now four lines of evidence in support of the historicity of that fact. First, we saw that the historicity of the burial narrative of Jesus supports, in turn, the historicity of the empty tomb. Secondly, we saw that the empty tomb is multiply attested in extremely early and independent sources, indeed as many as six independent sources. Thirdly, we explained that the use of the phrase on the first day of the week in the pre-Marcan Passion account of the empty tomb is indicative of a very early primitive uh, tradition that antedates the uh, already very early third day motif that you find in 1 Corinthians 15. And then finally, number four, we saw that the story is simple and lacks any signs of legendary embellishment or theological reflection. We come now to the fifth line of evidence in support of the discovery of the empty tomb, and that is that the tomb was probably discovered empty by women. Now, in order to appreciate this point, we need to understand two things about the role of women in first century Jewish society. First, women were not regarded as reliable witnesses. This attitude toward the testimony of women is evident in the uh, remark of the first century Jewish historian Josephus in his Antiquities of the Jews, section 219, where he describes the rules that were supposedly left by Moses which would um, regulate the admission of testimony. And according to Josephus, he says, let not the testimony of women be admitted because of the levity and the boldness of their sex. So women's testimony was uh, allegedly inadmissible because of their levity and boldness, uh, or in other words, uh, women are rash airheads and therefore cannot serve as credible witnesses. Now, no such regulation is in fact to be found in the Pentateuch. Rather, this is a reflection of the patriarchal first century Jewish society in which Josephus wrote. Secondly, women occupied a relatively low rung on the Jewish social ladder compared to men. Compared to men, women were frankly second class citizens. Consider these rabbinical texts. Sooner let the words of the law be burnt than delivered to women. Or again, happy is he whose children are male, but woe to him whose children are female. The daily prayer of every Jewish man included the benediction, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has not created me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Now, given their low social status and their lack of credibility as legal witnesses, how amazing it is that it is women who are the discoverers of and the principal witnesses to the empty tomb of Jesus. If the empty tomb story were a late developing legend, then it is most likely that male disciples, such as Peter or John, would have been made to be the discoverers of the empty tomb. The fact that it is women whose testimony was deemed unreliable were the chief witnesses to the fact of the empty tomb is best explained if, like it or not, they actually were the discoverers of the empty tomb, and the Gospel writers faithfully record what for them at least was a rather awkward and embarrassing fact. Now skeptical critics have proposed all sorts of creative explanations uh, for the women's role in the narrative, apart from 
their historicity. And some of these are just quite fantastic. For example, uh, John Dominic Crossan held that the women in the Premarkin passion story are the residue of an earlier source used by Mark called the secret gospel of Mark. Well, this theory blew up in Crossan's face when it was demonstrated that the secret gospel of Mark was in fact a forgery by Morton Smith and so never actually existed. The general problem with these uh, hypotheses is that any conceivable role for women to play in the narrative would have been better served by men and therefore the role of the women remains unexplained. For example, uh, Richard Carrier notes that when Josephus himself gives an account of the uh, conquest of Masada, the last stronghold of the Jewish resistance that was finally taken by the Romans, that he relies upon the testimony of two women to what happened in Masada. Well, the reason that Josephus relies upon women for that narrative is because they were the only ones left after the slaughter at Masada. What happened was that all of the men uh, killed everybody else in the Jewish compound. They slit everyone's throats and then committed suicide themselves. So the only people that were left were a couple of women and their children who hid in a cave uh, and so escaped this mass murder that occurred when the Romans took Masada. But had Josephus had male witnesses, he would certainly have preferred those. He was stuck with the female witnesses because that's all there was. So actually this bears out the very point concerning the evangelists' use of women witnesses. They were all there was. They were the ones who discovered the tomb empty and so the gospel writers faithfully record their testimony. But had this been a late legend not rooted in fact, then male disciples would have been preempted to fill the women's role. So the contrived nature of these uh, various attempts to explain away the women witnesses I think only serves to reinforce the historical credibility of this feature of the narrative. Indeed I would say that probably no other factor has proved as persuasive to contemporary New Testament critics in uh, accepting the historicity of the empty tomb as the role of these female witnesses. All right, number six then is that the earliest Jewish polemic presupposes the empty tomb. The earliest Jewish polemic presupposes the fact of the empty tomb. In Matthew chapter 28 verses 11 to 15 we have the earliest uh, Christian attempt to refute the Jewish polemic against the disciples' proclamation of Jesus' resurrection. This is what Matthew reports. Uh, While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, They gave a sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among Jews to this day. Now, our interest is not so much in Matthew's story of the guard at the tomb as in his incidental remark at the very end. This story has been spread among Jews to this day. This remark reveals that Matthew was concerned to refute a very widespread Jewish counter-explanation of the resurrection. At the time that Matthew wrote, this is what 
was being circulated among unbelieving Jews of his day. Now, what were the unbelieving Jews saying in response to the disciples' proclamation, He is risen from the dead? Were they saying, um, These men are full of new wine? Or, No, his body's still lying there in the tomb in the hillside? No, they said the disciples came by night and stole away his body. Now think about that. His disciples came by night and stole away his body. The earliest Jewish polemic did not deny the fact of the empty tomb, but instead entangled itself in a hopeless series of absurdities trying to explain it away. In other words, the Jewish claim that the disciples had stolen the body of Jesus itself presupposes that the body of Jesus was missing. It was not to be found and therefore had to be explained away. Now, skeptical New Testament scholars have dismissed Matthew's story of the guard at the tomb as an apologetic legend, something that was just made up to refute this Jewish allegation of theft of the body on the part of the disciples. But even if that were correct, even if we admitted that the story of the guard is just an, a Christian apologetic creation, the fact cannot be denied that the story of the guard at the tomb is aimed at, has its target as, this widespread Jewish allegation that the disciples had stolen Jesus' body, which itself presupposes the empty tomb, that the body was missing. Now, that the story of the guard at the tomb is not a creation by Matthew out of whole cloth is evident uh, in the non Matthean vocabulary that the story contains. You remember last week I described how Matthew's story is filled with non Matthean phrases or words that are not only unusual for Matthew, but many of which are unique to the New Testament, showing that he's relying on prior tradition. He's not just making this story up. But more than that, there is a kind of tradition history behind the narrative of the guard at the tomb. I think that the guard at the tomb story uh, evinces a kind of developing pattern of assertion and counter-assertion between unbelieving Jews and Christian Jews in Jerusalem. For example, at the first stage of the controversy is the Christian proclamation, the Lord is risen. This is what they preached in Jerusalem, the Lord is risen. Now in response to that, unbelieving Jews said, no, the disciples stole away his body. To this allegation, the Christian Jews then responded, no, the guard at the tomb would have prevented any such theft. To this, then, the Jews offered the counterclaim, no, the guard fell asleep. And that's how they were able to uh, steal the body. And then the Christian counterclaim uh, is, no, the chief priests bribed the guard to say that. So you can see how there's this developing pattern of assertion, counter-assertion, counter-assertion, counter-assertion as the polemic goes on. And this pattern probably goes right back to the earliest controversies between believing Jews and unbelieving Jews uh, in Jerusalem following the disciples' proclamation of Jesus' resurrection in Jerusalem. In response to the Christian proclamation that he is risen from the dead, the Jewish reaction initially was simply to say that the disciples had stolen the body. That was sufficient to explain why the body was missing. The disciples had stolen it. The idea of the guard at the tomb could only have been a Christian development, not a Jewish development. All the Jew had to say was the disciples stole the body from the tomb. But then the Christians would say, no, the guard would have prevented them from stealing the body. That would be a Christian development. Then at the next stage, 
there isn't any need for the Christians to tell about how the guard was bribed. Rather, what happens at that stage is to say that uh, is for the Jews to say, no, the guard fell asleep. And then it's only in response to the allegation that the guard had fallen asleep that the notion of the bribe needs to come up. So you can see that there is this developing pattern of uh, tit for tat, give and take, assertion and counter assertion that lies behind this story. Uh, and at the final stage, at the time that Matthew is writing, the Christian response that the guard was bribed is the one that is the, uh, then given by Matthew. So I think that we have here not a, a Matthean creation, but we have the end of a controversy that stretches right back to the early days in the city uh, as Jews and um, unbelieving Jews and Christian Jews um, made their assertions and counter assertions about Jesus' resurrection. And what the Jewish polemic or response to the Christian proclamation reveals is that the tomb was in fact empty, that the body of Jesus was missing and somehow this needed to be explained away. Now this is historical evidence of the highest quality because it comes not from the Christians, it comes from the very opponents of the early Christian movement itself. Those who had the most interest in denying the fact of the resurrection themselves presuppose the historicity of the empty tomb. Any comments or questions on that sixth line of evidence in support of the empty tomb? Yes, Don first. Just, just a question of interest. Has anybody ever done any calculations on how much that stone that they were supposed to have moved weighed? I have seen some calculations on that, Don, though I can't quote the estimate off the top of my head. If you go to Jerusalem today, in the park behind the King David Hotel, uh, near to the old city, there is a first century tomb. Uh, it's called the Tomb of Herod's family. And it still has its rolling disc-shaped stone that goes across the door of the tomb. So we actually have extant one of these stones and one could approximate how much it would weigh. It, it's, it's absolutely massive. And how many people would it take to move this right, stone? Right, it would take a lot of men because you see the way these tombs were built is there was a kind of groove that would descend to the door. The stone would roll down the groove and then be secured in place with a smaller stone. And it would be very, very difficult to push the rolling stone back up the tomb because you're working against um, gravity in, in doing so. So um, this, is, uh, this would be a truly massive stone that would require several men to move. And the guards, of course, slept through all this. Well, that's part of the absurdities of the story. As I said, um, what the Jewish leaders did was entangle themselves in a series of absurdities by this explanation because it's obviously absurd to think that a Roman guard sleeping in La La Land at the foot of the tomb would not hear a bunch of men trying to roll this massive stone up the groove and, and open the tomb. So. The, the, the story is a bald face fabrication on the face of it, uh, and that's part of the difficulty with the, with the story. Yes, Ben. I always laughed at this explanation because if they were asleep, how would they have known it was the disciples who stole the body, right? So even inherent in the explanation itself, it seems like there's a problem. I think, you, but, I think that's, that's technically true. If they were asleep and they woke up and found the body was missing, how would they know it was the disciples? Sure. On the other yes. hand, Ben, I think that would be a pretty fair inference it's, when it's, you it's, think about uh, it. I mean, who else yeah. would have an interest in stealing it? Uh, I think it would be very natural to accuse the disciples of having done so. So while that point might be technically correct, I think at the end of the day it's probably not a very strong one. I when, think 
wouldn't they God's also point know is better? Were the Romans, um, if they fell asleep on the job, executed? Is that a true historical? That's fact? my understanding is that right. they could be executed for dereliction of duty. And again, that's one of the absurdities involved right. in this all of story is that they would agree to spread a rumor right. for which they could be executed. Right. Um, that's, that's difficult to handle. Although, on the other hand, in allowing the body to be stolen, which was undeniable, they were already in dereliction of duty. So perhaps compounding it wouldn't be that serious, after all, if the chief priests could keep them out of trouble with Pilate. Well, so my actual question is, is there any sources that we have outside of Matthew that refer to this, refer to this, um, this explanation that came, came, came up? Any Jewish sources, Do you mean, fathers, or anything? Uh, that the disciples had stolen the body? Had stolen the body? Justin yeah. Martyr, who Justin was Martyr. one of the uh, early apostolic fathers, mentioned it. Justin Martyr wrote in the first decade of the first century, and he has a dialogue with a Jewish unbeliever called Trifo. It's called a dialogue with Trifo, a Jew. And in there, Justin Martyr mentions that Jews are saying this, that the disciples stole the body. Now, what we don't know is whether Justin had independent contact with Jews where he learned this, or whether he's reading his Gospel of Matthew and gets it from there. That's the difficulty with these later sources is that they know the Gospels, and so they could be using them as one of their sources. Similarly with the guard at the tomb, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Peter, which is this apocryphal gospel from the second half of the second century. And he, it has a Roman guard around the tomb. But this is probably based on Matthew's Gospel. He probably is embellishing Matthew's own story, and so it's not really an independent witness to the guard. Yes, Matt. Yeah, my, my question um, is about the actual guards themselves. Uh, some believe that they were actually temple guards. Yes. And not Roman guards. Uh, that's why they went to the chief priests and not to the Roman authorities. What is your opinion on that? I initially was attracted to that view, Matt, simply because it would make it easier to understand how the guard would agree to spread a rumor like this. If they were temple guards, then they would be under the direction of the chief priests and perhaps they could keep them out of trouble. But I honestly think that that's probably special pleading. It, it seems to me that the natural way to read the narrative when, Pilate, when they go to Pilate and ask for a guard for the tomb, and he says, you have a guard, he's not saying, you've got your own guard, use them. He, he's granting them the guard. He's saying, yes, yeah, you may have a guard, and go make it as secure as you can. And we do know that there was a Roman guard involved in the arrest of Jesus in, in John, because it mentions a centurion, or captain of the guard. And so that was not a Jewish guard that went to Gethsemane and arrested Jesus. That suggests that there was some sort of a Roman detail of soldiers that were secunded to the temple authorities and were under their direction. And that would make sense of the comment of the chief priests, if this gets to the governor's ears, we'll pacify him and keep you out of trouble. That would, that would naturally be understood as a way to protect these Roman guards from the governor's reprisal. So I think at the end of the day that this probably is thought by Matthew to be a Roman guard. But you're quite right that the temple authorities did have a temple guard that could have been used instead. Yes, Taylor. Um, is it common for uh, non-believing biblical historians to say um, that the whole story was fabricated in order to make it sound like it was plausible, or um, how, would you, how would you respond to a person that would say that? Well, I would respond in exactly the way I have responded, namely, you show that this is not a Matthean creation, that Matthew is using prior tradition as the vocabulary indicates, 
And then that you have this evident tradition history behind it of assertion and counter-assertion that would drive you right back to the earliest Jewish and Christian disputes in Jerusalem itself when the status of the tomb would have been public knowledge. And I think that gives good reason to think that this can't just be written off as an apologetic creation that was made up later. Do, do most but uh, what I want to emphasize, Taylor, is that, that that's not the crucial point here, because that's very controversial, whether the guard was historical or not. What I'm, what I'm suggesting is that the apologetic value of the story is that it shows that even the opponents of the early Christian faith presuppose that the body was missing and this had to be explained away. So even if you say that the Christians invented the guard story to refute these Jewish unbelievers, nevertheless, you're, you're still left with the fact that the uh, Jewish polemic itself presupposes the empty tomb. Well, I was referring more to the Jewish polemic itself, like, but, um, but is it common to, to, to have that type of counterargument to say that the whole thing was, was made up, or is it not common for biblical, non-believing biblical historians? Well, to now, say I guess like I'm that? not following your question. It's very common among contemporary New Testament scholars to say that the Matthean story of the guard at the tomb is just an invention by Matthew or is a late apologetic legend that arose in the church to refute this Jewish claim that the disciples had stolen Jesus' body. Well, let me wrap up uh, now. Um, I think taken together, these six lines of evidence constitute a very powerful case that the tomb of Jesus was in fact found empty on the first day of the week by a group of his women followers. As a historical fact, this seems to be well established. The New Testament scholar D.H. Van Dalen has said, and I quote, it is extremely difficult to object to the empty tomb on historical grounds. Those who deny it do so on the basis of theological or philosophical assumptions. But those assumptions cannot alter the evidence itself. According to the late Jakob Kramer, who was a New Testament uh, critic who specialized in the study of the resurrection, and I quote, by far most exegetes hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb, close quote. And he is talking there not about conservative or evangelical scholars, he's talking about the broad mainstream of New Testament scholarship by far the majority of them hold to the historical reliability of the empty tomb account. In fact, Gary Habermas, um, in a bibliographical survey, which he published in 2006, surveyed 2,200 publications since 1975 on the subject of the resurrection in English, French, and German, and he found that 75% of the scholars who have written on the subject accept the historicity of the discovery of the empty tomb. And since the publication of that article in 2006, Gary has continued to survey this literature. I think he's up over 3,500 articles and books today, and the percentage is roughly constant. About 75% of scholars who have written on the subject embrace the historicity of the empty tomb. In fact, the evidence is so good that quite a number of contemporary Jewish scholars, uh, such as Geza Vermish, and Pincus Lapid, have declared themselves convinced on the basis of the evidence that the tomb of Jesus was in fact found empty. Now these Jewish scholars don't themselves believe in the resurrection of Jesus, but they do grant the historicity of the discovery of his empty tomb. So I think that this first 
fact is one that is well established, uh, is very credible, um, and that therefore we can have confidence in the discovery of Jesus' empty tomb on the first day of the week by a group of his women followers.